prosecutor told you about it when I left the courtroom? Am I right about that? No. I was aware that it was an aggravated robbery offense. However, I believe Mr. Kennard was in between juvenile court and the adult system. So the wording, as it is listed on paper, can be confusing at times. But clearly, while this hearing's going on and we take a break, you're having conversations with the prosecutor about your testimony, correct? We didn't have a conversation. You didn't have a conversation while I was out of the room? No, I did not speak with you. Hmm. All right, nothing further. All right, anything else? All right, very well, you may step down, thank you. Do you have anything else it wishes to offer? No, I just want to sit with him. Um, be finished with testimony. All right, very well. So now I'm, I'm turning toward argument, um, and I will let the um, the defense go first. Mr. Riley. Well, I think the burden's on the state, so I think they should go first, shouldn't they, Judge? Well, um, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'll do. Well, if I let the state go first, then I let you go, then I let the state to go again. So I'm going to let you go first. All right, Your Honor. First of all, again, I'm going to renew my objections to proceeding without the presence of the defendant in the courtroom. That's number one. Um, I think he has a clear constitutional statutory right under the criminal rule to be present uh, in person. We do not waive his presence. Uh, and that has been clear from the onset. Regarding the code section of 2937.222, I do not believe that the three prongs of that statute have been met, which would qualify for uh, holding an inmate such as Mr. Kennard without bond. Um, I don't believe that the three standards have been met by any um, uh, measurable uh, burden of proof that uh, um, I think the first standard is that they have to uh, uh, show my glasses. The presumption is great and the proof is evident that the accused committed the offense. Here we have circumstantial evidence at best. Uh, they also have to prove the accused poses a substantial risk of physical harm to any person in the community. There's been absolutely no testimony as it relates to that factor. And finally, the last and third factor is that the state has to establish the proof and prove, prove that no release conditions will be will reasonably assure the safety of that person and the community. And since there's been no evidence of a threat, there is no way that they can establish that third prong. So I would ask the court to set a bond in this matter um, based on whatever pretrial release is recommending. Um, and I would ask the court uh, not to hold him without bond. Please note our obvious exceptions to everything. And, and finally, the, the, the code does call for a re-evaluation of this uh, determination that you make today, Judge. And I think the standard that says is if the judge, find, the later judge, finds information exists that was not known to the movement at the time of the hearing, and that information is material, and whether bail should be denied, they can revisit that issue. And I would say for the record that coming into today's hearing, uh, we have not provided any information regarding the facts and circumstances of this case, so everything is essentially uh, unknown prior to this hearing. Thank you. Very well. Ms. Banbury? With respect to that, Your Honor, the defense has not filed a written request for discovery. Once that occurs, um, I'm sure the state uh, at either level would be happy to oblige um, to the evidence that's available at this time. Counsel, Your Honor, has misquoted the statute. The statute says the state has the burden of proving that the proof is evident or the presumption is great that the accused committed the offense with which he is charged. Um, Your Honor, this case is obviously in the beginning stages of investigation. Um, things have been sent uh, to be analyzed, um, and I am certain there are other leads that the detectives are following in this case. Uh, but I believe what the court heard today satisfies the burden that the presumption is great that he committed this offense. Counsel also argued that proving that the accused poses a substantial risk of serious physical harm uh, to any person of the community has not been established. 
Well, the state feels that being investigated for two shootings is significant enough, one resulting in the death of a person. Are we going to risk allowing him out, out uh, at the risk of a death of another person? I would hope not. I would think not. Certainly, Your Honor, the evidence uh, satisfies that prong significantly. So, Your Honor, the state argues that there are no release conditions um, that would assure the safety of the community. We, we certainly cannot afford to allow this defendant to be on the streets and shooting people as he's driving by their cars on the highway. That's all I have, Your Honor. Very well. The court's had an opportunity to consider um, the evidence of the um, at this hearing. Uh, the court, first with respect to criminal history, um, finds that defendant has uh, two prior uh, felony convictions. One resulted in a four-year prison term for an F3 felony theft. That's a serious offense. The court doesn't consider that a low-level felony. Also, also on the earlier, also a um, an attempted aggravated robbery, which again, a serious felony. So there is a serious criminal history. Um, the court heard the testimony from Detective Connell, and there are uh, distinctive testimony about the black Camaro with tinted windows and tinted license plate that um, was consistently followed by the detective and the police during their investigation. Combining the tracking of the car and the license plate that comes back to the registration to this defendant is significant evidence. Defendant's phone being tracked in the car from Columbus to uh, this area on the diamond day in question, also significant. Defendant's statements made to Detective Connell placing himself in the black Camaro on the date and time, though not necessarily in the jurisdiction, are significant. The fact that the court has no ID on any other possible witnesses is a factor that weighs in the court's consideration. With respect to the danger to the public, the courts, especially considering that the eight shell casings, in this case, according to BCI, match another road rage shooting in Columbus in April of 2023. Given all of these factors and weighing, considering the court finds that the proof is evident and that the court's determination based on the weight of the evidence of the accused, the nature of the offense, of the charge of murder, the criminal history of the accused, and the potential for risk and harm and the fact that it involves gun violence causes the court to continue its order to deny bail. The court's understanding of this is that in two to three weeks, defendant will be presented to the in shorter time be presented to the grand jury that his case, if it's indicted, will be bound over to uh, the Summit County Court of Common Pleas, and at that time a bail review will occur. In the meantime, Mr. Riley, as you indicated, you could ask the court to reopen this hearing if you, during discovery, discover evidence, other evidence for the court to consider. Having concluded the hearing, we'll be in recess. Mr. Kennard, let me address you and just to say the court has made a decision that I'm going to continue to deny bond. You'll continue to be held without bond at the Summit County Jail. You will not be subject, uh, you will not be permitted to be released from that jail for any reason. I encourage you to stay in touch with your attorneys, please. Thank you, Mr. Kennard. You're all done.